Hello, my friends, and welcome to Quartet. So nice to have you with us today. I'm John Peterson from the Arlington Institute, and we get together like this every couple of weeks, fortnightly, to kind of look deeply into the big changes and the big issues that are related to the big changes that are happening on this planet today. I'm joined, as I always am, by a number of our regulars. Penny Kelly, Dr. Penny Kelly, is eating her lunch. Hi, Penny. Good morning, John. Good morning, Kingsley and Frank. Nice to meet you, Frank. Um, and everybody out there, thank you for being with us. And Kingsley Dennis is uh, here again from uh, probably the overcast skies of England. Yeah, you got it right, John, from the uh, from the grey clouds of England. So hello to you, Frank and Penny and everyone. Good to be here. And uh, today we're uh, happy to have a new guest uh, to join us, uh, Frank Jacob, who is uh, holds forth from uh, Germany and is a producer and a, a playwright and I don't know, are you a playwright or a screenwriter and a and a film producer. It's nice to have you with us and an author as, as well. Hi, Frank. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Hi, Kingsley. Hi, Penny. Good to be here. Yeah. So uh, let's get on to the subject of today uh, and our topic. And uh, I want to start by uh, telling you a couple of uh, stories. Uh, when I was at the uh, Desert Shield, which is the name of the operation that the U.S. military had going into Iraq. Um, I was out on the flagship working with my friend, who was the admiral, who was the commander of all the naval forces there. And uh, one of the things that uh, I took away from that whole experience, which was really quite interesting, was the fact that they um, had embedded press members within different military units across the whole area of operations. And uh, that these press guys were uh, sending back all of these, you know, real-time information. If you'll remember, that was a, a big uh, media show. Uh, Schwarzkopf and everything was on CNN every day, given a briefing and so on. And, you know, it was this quality qualitatively quite different than any other kind of a conflict in the <clears throat> military operation that the mil that the U.S. has been involved in. And uh, um, uh, it was a, turned out to be a real problem for the military because they uh, suddenly were working, you know, they were fighting two fronts at the same time. They had the stuff they had going on down in the war, but then the press is doing all this and they're asking them, all these crazy questions, informed questions every day. Uh, and it's getting broadcast all over the United States. And um, what the military did is decided after that, we're not going to do this again. And uh, they changed their policies and so that they could not, uh, they wouldn't embed any kind of uh, 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 press people anymore inside of the system. And they built all of these barriers to the press being able to uh, interview and participate and observe what was going on. And um, uh, it was an interesting dynamic to watch that happen because you suddenly said, ah, they're putting the things in place to shape the narrative here. So the next time something happens, i.e. now in Ukraine and so on, then uh, you have almost nobody that's on the ground that's uh, telling you really, uh, certainly from the U.S. press, that is uh, giving you any kind of objective kind of uh, uh, reporting from the whole thing. You know, recently, uh, we, we've all known, you know, from coming from Britain in the Second World War, all of the uh, Winston Churchill and all this kind of statesman-like stuff and who he was and never, never, never give up and all of these kinds of things. And there was this whole image that you had about it. And now there's books coming out, very well re researched books. And those books say he was a freaking drunk and that he was constantly, you know, that they had to deal with the whole thing and that Hitler had on seven different occasions tried to 
broker a peace and didn't want to get into the war, but uh, Brits and wanted to make the whole thing happen and wouldn't even talk to him. And all of these concepts and these basic ideas that you had about that war, and I can tell you similar things about Vietnam and every kind of stuff that they, they made all these stuff up. And so the kind of question for us today is that um, you can sit here and walk your way around life as we know it today, and you can just see the mechanism that's in place to manipulate reality. It's very 1984-like, you know, to, to, to essentially uh, generate a whole artificial inverted, if you will, Kingsley, kind of reality uh, that is going to, you know, all of the things being able is going to going to carry the day in terms of history and people looking back and they're going to say, well, what happened? And they're going to say, well, this woke thing just showed up and guys decided they weren't guys and women and they couldn't tell the difference. And, yeah, you know, and it's and it's almost as though you, it was just kind of a natural thing that emerged. And um and that raises the question, a pretty big question, I think an important one about uh, uh, wh what in the past uh, are there, in addition to things like second, things in the Second World War and Vietnam and stuff that could have been, uh, that we're finding out now are not what we've been told, what we were all taught in school. And more importantly, why is this important? Why is it that if, the kind of the essence of our story, our human story, uh, suddenly becomes uh, suspect. Maybe it, yeah. It, what what does it do to who we are? What does it say to the world going forward in that regard? Why is history wrong? You know, and it's because it's what we have as history was is really just propaganda. So that's a a, a small piece of it. A lot of it is hearsay. And gossip, um, you know, it's a, it's also wrong or doesn't have the whole story because you can't tell the whole story in one story. It's it's a composite of a whole bunch of perspectives. And for most people writing history, they have a specific thing they're focused on. And of course, they do research. They talk to other people, but it's still a very very limited perspective. Um, the next thing is that. And this is the bottom line in history. There's too much dogma. You know, there's too much. You, know, you got to believe this. You got to promote that. You got to think it, at, look at it, you know, understand it this way. And that's not the way it is. And when you read the alternates to, you know, I read those things about um, Hitler trying to make peace and the, and the betrayal that happened. And I see the same thing. Um, happening today, they're using Zelensky as a scapegoat, you know, as a, a, you know, he's a piece of chattel where they can continue. The war in Ukraine is not a war at all. It's just money laundering operation. So, but it's going to come down to the people of the future as a war. So, um, so what difference does all that make? You know, um, it makes a big difference to those people who want to see something good happen it makes a huge difference. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. And, and when you tell the story the way it didn't happen, you get a different outcome. So that outcome leaves people feeling satisfied or unsatisfied, settled or unsettled. And all of the history that's out there is designed to make people feel unsettled. So, you know, so though, so I asked some questions, you know, have we ever had the truth about history? Um, and so, so these are questionable stories for, around history. Who built the pyramids? If they're 12, 13,000 years old, it certainly wasn't the Egyptians. Um, the whole flat earth theory. Where did that come from out of the Middle Ages and now recurring today just to confuse people? And some people are falling for that. Um, what were the real reasons for the Civil War? It wasn't anything that they said it was, nothing. 
It was about money and investors and et cetera. Um, another thing, is fiat money sustainable? No. What's the real history? Hardly anybody, nobody's read, you know, The Creature from Jekyll. I, well, I shouldn't say nobody. A lot of people have read it, but there's a huge belly, underbelly of people that don't even think about the money and what it means and what the history of money is. Who killed JFK? Now, what a joke that story is. Um, what brought down the trade towers in New York? There's another fake history. God forbid that all of those become our legacy as we move into the future. You know, I would hope that we would get to the point where we can begin to get some truth. Um, and, you know, the whole history behind the Spanish flu. That's a, another biggie right there. So why does it matter? Why does history matter? It matters because we learn from our experience. And history is the accounting of our experience. Then if we don't have the right history, we're not going to learn anything. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, one of the beginnings. In the beginning was the word. I mean, everybody knows where that line comes from. Um, history is like a text. It's History is read to a lot of degree, but it's also read into us. And when we have this textual information, which is coming into the system, into the program and programming the program, in a sense, it's a kind of spell. Textual information is used as a kind of spell. And that's why it's no accident, for example, if we go back to the early mythology of, of the gods, we've had Hermes and Mercury are associated with the beginnings of the alphabet and with magic. We have the Egyptian god Thoth, Thoth uh, associated with, uh, you know, language, alphabet, uh, and magic. The, the Norse god Odin with the runes and with magic. So you see, the idea of presenting a text presents a story. And the story is part of magic. Because it's, and of course, magic is part of ritual. So... In a sense, we're under a spell, and history is a program that writes a spell, which is why when we look at the outer physical events and some of the events that, that Penny have talked about, you know, and there's many events, you know, John, World War uh, events, and, you know, you know, the Pearl Harbor, uh, Gulf of Tonkin, 9-11, these are, can be seen as ritualistic events that then change the magic spell, change the program. So just like the song says, I put a spell on you. So looking at the bigger picture, then, you know, rather than singing it, we can look at it. Um, we're being read. A program is being read into us and we are responding to that. We're giving the we have been given the variables. So if we remember that if we are a, all physicality is the, the vessel whereby we interact with this reality paradigm, this domain. And so um, through these vessels, we are giving information from the program. And then, of course, we we process it and we put it out. And so we actually then validate the program. So history basically is a line of text, just like these days we can see a computer program is line of text. So we history then is read into us. So, of course, the lines of text are always changing because sometimes if you want to go back, and look into a program, where did that glitch come from? And you show you can look into a computer program and say, ah, that's where the glitch was inserted. And so you can see then history is a similar thing. There's false history or you know a con a conversion of the code or a glitch in the code. Um, but you know, code, spell, text, incantation, history, for me, is the whole thing. So or similar thing. Uh, George uh, Orwell summed it up nicely when he said, those who control the past, who can, uh, control the future, and those who control the present, control the past. And so that pretty much says it very clearly. That means that, you know, it's their timeline. Whoever shapes the perception of our thoughts in the present is using what they're feeding us in terms of what happened in the past as a way to reinforce this time loop that that uh, Kingsley was talking about it. So 
you know, if you're being fed information about the past, which is incorrect or fake or manipulated, and even if you're well-meaning and you're revolutionary, you want to change things in the world, if you're reaching back to precepts and history and information and data and history that is false, then you're going to take the wind out of the sails of dissent because you're continually reinforcing the same pattern, even though you might think you're doing something to change it. And I guess World War II is a very... Uh, pregnant topic you could say because it's never really been processed in the modern age and what's happened is that much of the narrative has been obviously written by the victors and some of the narrative has actually been codified and lost that you can't even contest some things that happened they're just they happened and that's that's what happened and you just have to accept it and if you get in to try and mine with a modern tools and better sources of information to revise the story now revisions become a four letter word you know revisionists out there are having the greatest problem because they're finding things that just don't gel with that version of history we've been taught and they're going to great lengths to publish that information they're being attacked every which way from every direction so what used to be you know the idea of an internet where we could come out and share like we never could ever before which is true has rapidly become a tool to control us because now they've built algorithms which control thought and they allow certain things out there and other things are, are just attacked by the so-called fact checker bots or whatever they are out there nowadays and so again here they are trying to streamline what we believe is happening and if you know you can take um george orwell's thought a little bit further you know who, he who controls the past controls the future and apply it to another sort of modern day guru's uh statement yuval harari who's kind of the guru of the, the wef people who says that he who controls data controls the future and so they're now in the process of moving us from you know being um sovereign in the sense that nothing penetrates our skin we can still have our own personal opinion to moving beneath the skin as he describes into our bloodstreams so that they can actually build you know machines within our bodies that pass the blood brain barrier and begin to replace our neural networks this sounds like science fiction but i'm telling you everything i'm talking about is reality and they're building these systems into our systems so that they can control even our thoughts right so even you know not only do you have the you lose the ability to to be discerning but you're being impregnated with technology nefariously behind your without you even realizing it and ultimately i think what we're trying to manifest here in this reality is the ultimate expression of free will as creator beings and if that free will is being taken away from us what is left you know in a way if they begin to remove the ability for us to have critical thinking and they begin to move the younger generations away from studying the dangerous written history which might be being dug up by the revisionists and replace it with the TikTok five minute or two minute or one minute video versions so that the young generation begins to inform itself with a sanitized version of the script writers then we lose history. Literally, literally, what's happening in front of our eyes right now is the digital form of book burning. Um, Kingsley, when you said um, that history is a spell, just hit me like a brick that, oh my God, all those words that I learned how to spell when I was in grade school, I didn't realize I was conjuring magic and learning how to create spells. <laughs> and and uh, what you were saying, John, I mean, I'm reminded... Like you said, when this kind of awakening happens and this this spell drops, so to speak, people are going to be, you know, quite shocked and angry, the first response. And, you know, I'm just thinking, that, again, the bigger picture is that generally when a person enters a process of, let's say, initiation, the, you know, the process is part of deconditioning because you have to take everything off before you can start again to learn anew. You have to take off all the layers of, of the program, so to speak. In the in the way in the you know antiquity initiation was a very private secret affair. They took people out of society, and you went to initiation. So so you weren't kind of damaged or damaging society. It was a private thing, and then you came back quietly to change the you know to change things quietly to change the program quietly. What it seems like it now is that you know the whole ball game has changed. The playing field has changed. I think humanity is going through a global initiation. And it's an intense one. You know, it's, it can't be like 50 years in, in a Pythagoras school is going to be 
10 years or five years in the world school. And when people are taking off that conditioning, then they're going to start seeing clearly. And that's going to create a lot of anger, which if we don't restrain and channel it, it very likely could be into civil unrest for sure. The main problem with civil unrest, though, is that, um, you know, people might get outraged, but if they haven't evolved consciously to a point where they stay calm and they look around and try to get their bearings on what's going on, then they're going to be sucked into this vortex of players. And one of the first things that I ever learned in my process of waking up was that there's something called professional agitators, you know, people that would show up at rallies you know, they'd have the T-shirts and the signs and then and the cameras would roll and they'd be there and like they'd be doing their thing. And then if you didn't know better, which I at that point, I was very green to this kind of stuff. I'm like, you'd believe it, you know, and, and the people who scream the loudest then pull that attention upon them. And you find out that they've just you just get further manipulated if you don't know to see through the facade. So mm -hmm. I personally think that the future revolution has to happen in every one of us we have to kind of say you know what i've i've seen that game i've seen that cycle that pattern here it is again whatever form it takes i'm not going to i'm not going to participate i'm just not going to do it i'm going to draw the line and i'm not waiting for the white hats to ride and i'm not going to you know i'm just not going to do that same pattern everybody else is doing and it has to be so infectious that a, a mass of people also don't participate and there's a stillness and out of stillness you can have a rational birth of something new and something exciting which is i think what we want to do i think the universe actually wants to make this leap with us and i just read a headline yesterday i didn't go in to see is this headline true are they making something up you know what's the real story but it was canada's burning books literally burning library books in order to erase history and I thought, how how could we be doing that in this time when we know better? But what your comment drove home was it's happening at all the levels. <laughs> Everywhere mm -hmm. words are spoken at that clash with the narrative. And and so here we are. Because you say the problem is is that there's been a there's been a kind of sustained project to dumb down people's receptivity people's state of consciousness with the materials you know education these days is a is a terrible affair for the most part you know programming kind of workhouse prussian academy type of mentality and you know now with this kind of you know tiktok and snapchat kind of five second attention span is that you know they're trying to make it so we're not a danger to them because we're not a danger to anybody we're just soft-bellied jellyfish you know and I think someone has called us a jellyfish generation. And that's true in some part, in some part. But I think there's a lot of shifts coming through now. But we need a maturity of consciousness. So we don't react. We consider, we respond. And we realize that reacting in tunes us with their frequency, which is keeping us in the loop. So to respond and shift our frequency. So it's, we need a response kind of mode that I think is coming through, but we need, I mean, con consciousness is perhaps the most contagious thing there is, more contagious than biological elements. So we, you know, if there's enough, you know, kind of frequency shift going on, it can ripple out. And we get into that stage where, you know, both, let's say, elements are pushing for, for getting the kind of, you know, the playing field. But um, I'm still positive. I'm still positive. I have to, I have to say something in defense of all the sheeple. The, the people that are referred to as sheeple. Um, and I said this before, but I think it's really important to say it again. There is this, I forget if it was Kingley or Frank, I think it was Frank, said that there's this uh, very small number of people. We are way more than they are. Um, when you look at the human body and you consider you know, the uh, spine and the, the DNA and all the stuff uh, that we have in the physical body, there's what scientists will say is, uh, well, there's a few pieces that are really important and the rest is junk DNA. And I think that's the way that the powers that be or the powers that want to be look at the sheeple, the, the people that they don't think have any value. But if you have leaders, um, you need people to follow you. 
and and you need that huge mass of people to hold what the leadership is saying and that's the value of the people that aren't really doing anything spectacular they're just they just want to live they just want to be happy and so if there's a few leaders that come out of the of this time and they're saying something that goes against that narrative and people are looking kind of half listening for a long time before they really get on board that mass of people begins to hold the values of the new leadership and you need that you can't just have two groups of leaders and no followers you will have like, it's the followers that make it work i like that phrase penny holding the pattern because you know you can be a part of this change without being you know so consciously aware you can still be a part of it you know um so if there is a frequency anchoring coming in then a lot of people, if they're receptive to that, they can be a part of the anchoring, perhaps without being consciously aware of it. They're just on, you know, since we're talking about history, they're just on the right side of history by being there. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. I, I think we're going to be fine. It's going to be messy. It is messy. Mm -hmm. We'll be fine. Well, yeah, it's necessarily messy, but uh, every indication, uh, you know, there's a lot of them, including, you know, s some of the things from King's Ace inversion book uh, s suggests that there's uh, light at the end of the tunnel. You just got to get from here to there. Well, mm -hmm. I, I, we're about we're out of time here. I want to remind all of our viewers that uh, we do this every two weeks and we will be back uh, with another topic and a great d discussion. And uh, we thank Frank, very much for being a part of our discussion today. This comes uh, to you from the Arlington Institute, which is um, the little think tank organization that I started 35 years ago, uh, specifically to look into the future and kind of scan the horizon and try to make some sense out of this giant, unprecedented kind of change that's going on around us and in particular to try to build a vision for a new world and some uh, processes and plans and direction for how you get to the new vision and so the many programs that we have here including our uh, our newsletter future edition and then we've got transition talks which is our uh monthly speaker series frank will be one of our speakers here coming up toward the end of the year penny's been here greg's been here we still haven't gotten kingsley over here yet but we're, we're working on it um and we've got a whole wonderful lineup of uh, speakers and you can find out about all of that at arlingtoninstitute.org and we always have a wonderful weekend uh when we have transition talks because we have people come from all over the east coast to mm -hmm together to to participate in the in the in the discussion so thank you all uh nice to have you as part of this conversation and, and all of you who are viewers thank you for being a part of this uh we can't do this it doesn't make any sense if we sit here and just talk to ourselves and so it's nice to have you with us and if, if you find this helpful i hope you'll share it and send it to your friends and tell them about uh, what we're doing here and so thank you all, and we'll see you uh, in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Frank. Amen. And Penny and Kings. Thank you. Yeah. Thank hey, you. Kings, everyone.